Hello, it's 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Time to get started. Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and q and I'm Dave McCormick from Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to present uh, Dion McCormick, no relations, who is going to be talking today. Uh, I think he's going to be talking a little bit about the Alpha Roadmap, but I may have gotten that wrong, sorry. Uh, we'll find out, uh, And but he'll more importantly, he will be answering your questions. So you could go ahead and start at, uh, entering those questions right now by typing them into the questions box out of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, also, I want to let you know that this session is recorded. You can find copies of these recordings at videos.alphasoftware.com. All right, so let's begin. Hello, Dan, are you there? Yes, sir. Good to talk to you. Welcome back from your vacation. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. Quick. Thank you. You should see a dialog box. Oh, and I see your screen, so we're all set to go. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this week. My name is Dan McCormick, Lead Solutions Engineer for Alpha. And I've got a couple quick things. One is a quick demonstration of a neat uh, feature in Alpha that's helpful. Uh, that I would like you to be aware of. And then second is just a real quick uh, roadmap update. Just want to kind of keep you posted on how we're coming along. Uh, in late last year, we did a roadmap overview. It's uh, online at our video library, so feel free to check into that. But I'd like to check in and you know keep you posted on how things are coming along. We're uh, rapidly approaching actually over the mid of Q1 and slated for later release at the end of this kind of quarter. So a lot of good stuff coming and a lot of very exciting pieces there. A quick recap last week I uh, wanted to let you know and is that we went over some of the built-in help capabilities of Alpha. Uh, we talked a bit about the uh, built-in help system in Alpha. We also talked about a built-in video system where you can find videos. Uh, we also have our vibrant Alpha message board very, wi very widely used and very used handy and a lot of really good content there, both historical but also uh, more recent and ways to get help. Uh, we also have our new and improved help site which is coming online uh, a bit later this year and last but not least is that we have the Alpha Professional Services that are available for people who just maybe need more support for a larger project or need some mentoring from those kind of solutions. So Alpha provides a lot of really powerful help capabilities um, built into the tool but also surrounding the tool to help you out. So make sure you uh, avail yourself of those capabilities and also let us know. And in uh, relationship to that, uh, this is a Q&A forum, meaning that if you go to your get, go to webinar control panel, look for the questions area. Please enter your questions. Dave will be monitoring those. And our goals are to uh, get that information back to you as quickly as possible in this format or later. In fact, we just got an email this morning from one of our wonderful uh, developers regarding that. I'm, I'm still analyzing that uh, email and getting a little bit more data around it. Uh, so I'm not sure if we're going to cover that today, but we definitely will be responding to it and making sure that we cover those kind of aspects there. So again, what I want to go through today, while you're busy typing in your questions there, is show you a nice feature in Alpha, especially as your systems get more complicated, and also uh, wanted to uh, then do a quick roadmap update. And that should only take another 10 minutes or so, and then the balance, we can open it up to the rest of the team for their Q&A. So uh, I'm going to jump over into my alpha development environment and Dave just made sure things are kind of flowing along okay. Hopefully we've got a good network connection today. Yep, it looks good. Excellent, excellent. Good to know. Okay, so uh, as you can see as you start developing, especially when you start developing mobile applications, uh, your uh, UXs can get actually fairly complicated because you're going to have uh, a lot of different things. You're going to have panel layouts. You're going to have panel navigators with multiple panels that are involved with it, and that can start uh, really getting pretty busy. And so it can somewhat, sometimes get a, little, you know, it's easy to get lost as some of these get a little bit larger and larger. And there's some other techniques we'll be talking about uh, after the next release. They'll help you to break this into subcomponents and hook it up so you can even manage more complex projects. But I want to show you one in particular is that. If you'll notice at the top of my UX screen, and for people who are new, 
This is our UX builder, which is our form. On the left are the different controls that are available and code that's available. In the middle is the layout of my, uh, in this case, a mobile UX or a mobile interface. And on the right-hand side is the details for each LM. As you can see, I have a fair number of panels in here, uh, button groups, things like that. It starts to get a little busy. Uh, and definitely man manageable, but as we develop more complex, you're going to need more support in doing so. So if you'll notice up at the top, above this area, there is a, it looks like a, uh, magnifying glass. And if I click on that and open it up, you're going to notice in here a set of, uh, or a find function. So you'll notice that within here is showing me everything within my system. And then I can uh, type something in here, let's say hazmat, and it's going to start filtering the different items within my uh, my UX. So if I'm trying to find a specific control, I can then go in and use this filter function here to find that control, click on it, and it's going to take me right to that control. So therefore I don't have to sit there and scroll up and down and try and look at all the details. I merely have to say, okay, go here, type in what I'm looking for. And where that becomes very, very powerful is that if you're disciplined in terms of setting up your panel card naming, uh, these are panel cards that hold content. So each of these panel cards hold a different set of content. If you've got that information in there, what that allows you to do is do a quick search and start typing in your panel card names, uh, let's say pet guards, and you can see it's going to go, oh, there's that, that's the one I want, take me right to that panel card. So very, very handy. And again, it's reached, or the way you get to it is up here you have a little magnifying glass in your UX Builder, you click on that. You could start typing in your filter here, uh, but also you'll notice here you can say select a panel footer, uh, and there's other ways to do uh, filtering on these pieces here. So you can see your different text boxes. Uh, let's say you know you have a signature capture in there. You can do it basically on the data bound controls, and or you can go down here. So let's look at one. Let's say it's a button. I can click here, and you'll notice. It's just showing me all of my buttons or my images. These are my images in there. Uh, maybe I have a, nope, no hyperlinks in there. Uh, I don't think we do we have a placeholder, one placeholder here. But, you know, buttons right here so I can see that. So you can use a combination of each, either a sort of free text search using the filter function up there, or over here you can say I want to get a, let's say it's a text area. Ah, here are my text areas right here. Oh, here's my text boxes my labels, et cetera. And maybe I've got some lists in here. I can go in there and go, okay, great, I want to go to that list. And that really saves you a lot of time of having to go up and forward and looking for the detail in there, saves you time. So check that out. There's actually a new capability, which is even more interesting. I'm, it's on the latest pre-release build, and I'll show you a demonstration of that in the next couple of weeks once I've upgraded. But it actually even improves this area to help you get a better idea of the structure of your interface. Uh, because again, as you grow in complexity, the structures will grow in complexity and Alpha is adding continually more capabilities for you to be able to uh, work with uh, and make it easy to find the things you are looking for. So check that out. Go into your UX component, click the little search button up here, and off to the races. By the way, that's available if you just hit Control Find on your, di so that's the Control uh, key and F that you'll notice over here it's saying control F. If you hit that, it's going to do the same thing and open this up without having to click on this button here. So check it out, enjoy it, and uh, use it. I think as you start using it uh, and as you develop more complex uh, user interfaces, your life will get easier and easier and easier. Okay, so that's a quick demonstration of one of the nicer new little features that are in, is in the interface. And that's one of the neat things is Alpha goes through and develops and puts together uh, you know, more capability all along the time way, Alpha, the development team, is adding in these neat, neat little features and capabilities to make your development process more productive. So I'm actually going to jump down now here, and what I'd like to do is a roadmap update. So basically, uh, again, a few months ago, I went through and did a full uh, sort of explanation of what the upcoming 
uh, roadmap. And this roadmap was presented at the Alpha DevCon 2015, uh, which I hope everybody's getting ready for DevCon 2016. Almost here. It goes so fast. Uh, but it's really exciting, all the different things. And so I want to take a few moments to walk through the different items that are coming, but more importantly is kind of what's already in place ready for you to check it out. So I'm going to go into my uh, roadmap, and you're going to see that there's probably eight major areas. Okay, so first is mobile optimized forms, and this is the signature feature for the Alpha Anywhere V4 to, uh, release scheduled towards the end of this quarter. Uh, so this is allowing you to put in place forms that are much easier to use on a mobile platform. And if you'll look in here, in the latest pre-releases, you're going to start seeing new capabilities. Uh, I don't have it in this one, but there's new items called view boxes and view forms. And actually, if you go to our pre-release page, and let me show you that on my screen right here, uh, if I go to the alpha pre-release notes, uh, and this is the long kind of... Uh, here, but I just go to Google, say Alpha pre-release, you'll notice that you have downloads for the pre-release and then a lot of documentation down here in terms of the new features and capabilities. And you'll notice that in the pre-release, a lot of these functional elements are starting to show up. So for instance, view, uh, the first is what are called view boxes and view forms are now available for you to play with there. So those, again, are in pre-release, they're not production release yet, and there's a lot of enhancements going into the genies to make it very easy for you to develop mobile optimized forms. So those are in there, and those are coming along very nicely. They're maturing very nicely. What I like about it is that by the time we get to the version 1.0 release of mobile optimized forms, not only is the raw capability going to be in there, but the team has been very successful at figuring out, well, how can I implement this quickly using genies and other techniques like that. And so you're going to see when it's released that there's not only the capability but a lot of support and documentation around that. We're very, very excited from that standpoint. The second is called the data connectors. And we actually started talking about this last week after some great uh, 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 questions that came from the team, specifically the ability to connect to what are called non-SQL database support. And in this case, which is very exciting, is in this is Mongo. And Alpha has already released in the pre-release the ability for you to connect to a Mongo NoSQL database and be able to leverage that within the Alpha development environment. And if you go to, and I'm going to jump back over here, onto the pre-release notes, you're going to see a series of videos and example components, etc that you can walk through that will show you and demonstrate how this capability is done. So as Alpha releases these capabilities in the pre-release, they're adding in instructional videos and other pieces here that you can watch. And these are very informative. They're put together by Selwyn. And it's going to show you how easy it is for you, in this case, to connect to MongoDB, which is a non-SQL database, a NoSQL database, and how easy it is to leverage it using your existing skill sets. So I, t I, I encourage you, if you get a chance, even if you're not planning on implementing uh, Mongo at this point in time, check out the videos. Each video is, you know, four or five minutes long. It's very restrained, and it'll only take you a little bit of time. But it kind of starts that mental, like, engine going in terms of what's coming down and how it's going to work. But what's exciting, if I go back to the roadmap, is that this is the first in a series of new data connectors that are going to be able to allow us to connect to these non-SQL, non-traditional connections, and it's very, very exciting. And Mongo is the first one, but there's a whole series of other ones that are industry standards that are coming down here. And you can use them with grid and UX components. It's, it's great. It's going to be so much fun. And what we're going to find out, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the full release, one benefit of NoSQL over SQL is that SQL usually requires a fair amount of homework and setting everything up. Mongo uses what's called NoSQL, and in this case, all it's doing is storing data as JSON strings in a database uh, that's accessible or a file system that's accessible. And again, I'm going to go in more detail in a future one, but the cool thing about it is that instead of creating this complex database structure, you can actually create JSON objects, and JSON objects could have parent-child relationships, multiple items, etc. and you store all that in the database and be able to retrieve it, you'll be able to put together prototypes and other things much quicker than you could before. So it's very exciting stuff, and these data connectors that Alpha is adding are going to be really, really handy from that standpoint there.
Now the other area is in web services. Uh, this will allow you to simply point to a SOAP web service and then be able to quickly wrap that web service and make it available as a function within the system. And again, this is now available in pre-release format, so you can place with it. So let me go over here. I'm back to my pre-release notes. And so let me do a find here of uh, uh, so. Let's see, do I have that in this one? Uh, so here you go. Calling SOAP servers. There's a new set of genies that make it easy to register and call. Here's a video. I encourage you again, even if you're not planning on using this, watch it. It'll kind of get your uh, head uh, starting to rock and roll. And this is very, very cool, and there's more detailed information here. But this web services is very powerful because there's an enormous amount of third-party web services that are available, both uh, previous older ones and newer ones that are available that you'll be able to avail yourself to improve your uh, ability of your application to access outside information sources to encourage and improve the capability of there. So the SOAP services are coming along very well. Again, we have pre-release that's available for you to check out there. The other area is Node.js. Um, uh, this has not been released yet, but the team's working very, very hard on improving the integration with Node.js with Alpha. And I'll tell you, Node.js is going to open up another whole range, much like the SOAP services where you can connect into very easily third-party services. Same thing, Node's going to allow you to very quickly connect into third-party services uh, so you're able to basically uh, integrate that Node code into your uh, system very readily, connect to other ones. And that's the one powerful about Node is that there's an enormous amount of libraries that have been pre-built for third systems that make life really easy for you. So we're very excited about that. That again is kind of under the covers. It's in process. Uh, I haven't seen much in terms of any pre-release stuff there, but it's well on its way for release in version 1.0. The new style builder, again, no, that's a, in process, making great progress, uh, but is not in the pre-release yet. But what's great about that, it's going to make it much easier for you to edit uh, styles in the system and to add and modify your styles. And we also will be having a presentation in the near future. There's a lot of work being done in here, both internally at Alpha, but also uh, by an outside Alpha developer who's working hard at bringing in Bootstrap uh, templates and making them work with Alpha out of the box. And we'll do a presentation of that in the very near future. Uh, there's some new features and capabilities on the market now. Very excited about that because it's really going to allow us to improve the look and feel of Alpha solutions. Alpha has always been extremely is easy, extremely powerful to develop solutions. But some, you know, one of the things people say is, ah, it looks a little dated. The styles look a little bit like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, etc. This is going to change all that. Basically, the, the initiative around the style capability will allow you to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other web system in terms of making your application look gorgeous, along with having heavy-duty plumbing to make it work fabulously. The other thing that this is all exciting about is that you're going to be able to tie in and use third-party developers who are experts in CSS, and, and it's going to be much easier for you to work with them. It's really cool in that area. So that's in progress coming along, and uh, we'll probably see some of that pretty soon. IIS, actually a lot of work is going on IIS. Um, the uh, plugin continues to advance and improve. The development team is really enhancing that, uh, getting a lot of real world. It's been in beta and out, and we've been gathering up an enormous amount of input from people who have been using IIS, and that's coming along very nicely. And uh, those have been incrementally added to the pre-release. So uh, in the pre-release notes, you'll see a lot of notes around uh, the improvements that have been added to IIS to make it much easier to work with, and uh, that's moving along steadily for a official release in, with the V4 Alpha Anywhere release. A WebSocket applications that is in the pre-release now. Uh, in fact, there's some really cool stuff that's been added to that. I've done a presentation on that where it allows you to basically WebSockets allow you to register and then distribute messages. So instead of having clients pull a server, the server is going to call there. And so let me go in here. But one of the cool things about WebSockets that's coming along really nicely, oops, let me go to the top here and see, let's see where that is. Socket. Okay. This is your video right here, building real-time applications. 
using web sockets here and you'll see there's some videos here but there's a lot of enhancements that are being added behind the scenes to improve web sockets specifically to allow you and we talked about this a bit before is that there's something called subscription where what you can do is when you create a web socket which allows you to receive messages from the server saying hey guess what something on the server changed so update yourself now like refresh a grid or redisplay something what's nice is that you can set up what are called subscriptions and that's being added in as we speak now and what those subscriptions do is allow you to say oh only listen for these messages here and therefore it reduces network traffic and makes everything work uh, very nicely but to get familiar is just watch these series of videos there's some components you can download here and this is going to be very very fun very very exciting stuff when we get to the full release but that's coming along really nicely uh, teams very hard on that and then last but not least is the new documentation website with that that's coming along also very very nicely um, Dave do you want to mention anything on that any updated news or anything since you're really the person leading that it's, initiative. It's uh, it's coming along. Um, I've seen the we've gone through a lot of iterations for interface stuff, and uh, but it's it's looking very promising. Um, I'm going to say that there'll be a version within the next 30 days or so that'll be the officially live and you could play with it version. Uh, Excellent. So uh, that's that's my prediction. It may even be sooner. Yeah, that's going to I'm very excited about that. And we appreciate all the work that Dave and his extended team are doing to put this together because uh, what I anticipate is that it will become the developer's best friend. Uh, and uh, the goal of this is not just a documentation site that gets released. Uh, Dave, you weren't with us last week, but I really let him know that there was a very strong feedback loop built into this system so that the developers, as they start to use it, can really feed back what's good, what's bad, what could be improved so that this documentation site can become better and better and better and better uh, to service the developer community. So we're very excited about it. I can't wait. I'm getting tired of Google and everything, so it's going to be perfect uh, it will in terms be of being able to access it from my standpoint. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, I really, I'm going to cut it off there. I just wanted to go through a quick update to everybody to let them know everything is on track coming together very nicely again it's like a duck uh, you know paddling like hell underneath you're going to be able to go into the pre-release notes and be able to see demonstrations of the technology but those are just the, the initial sets they are pre-release so highly recommended that you do not use pre-release in production in fact it says that at the top of this page but what's great about this this will give you a flavor where it's going to allow you to start at testing and experimenting so when the official release comes out you're going to be well prepared and we'll also know that that code has been hammered on has all the for service support and documentation features around it to make you very successful and as you can see there's a lot of stuff in here there is an enormous amount of work that's going on to take the v3 version of alpha and turn and basically supercharge and turbocharge it for v4 and at every step of that they're already planning v5 v6 etc it really is going to reduce your efforts while increasing the value of the platform for you and what you can do with it so we're very excited with that so with that what i'm going to do at this point that's just a quick roadmap update as we get closer to the actual release date and we start seeing some dates and stuff like that we're going to do two things one is we're going to um uh, let you know and obviously keep you posted so you'll know when that's going to go official and live but also we're going to be planning out some webinars that are post the uh, release of that that will kind of do deep dives into the different new features and capabilities kind of build on the videos you'll see and also be able to answer your Q&A in a live fashion so we're working with the development team as they get closer to the release date to not only have that ready to go but also have the webinars that are on ready to go after the fact uh, to help really make sure that you can uh, start using these technologies as quickly as humanly possible so we're very very excited about that so with that Dave what I'm going to do is go ahead and hand it back to you and allow you to check out the questions there and um, if you haven't entered your questions enter them now I, I couldn't agree with that uh, sentiment more. Uh, we have very few questions, which is surprising given the number of people who are live here today. It makes me think it's broken. I know, and we had but, a small uh, crew last week. I'm, I'm going to say the word disappointed, but I'm going to keep that, you yeah. know. I'm not okay. yelling it. I'm just saying, hmm. Come on. Send us some questions, please. Go ahead. Type them into the question. Come on. We do have – I did get one by email, and I do have one yes. from before, so let's uh, – 
Let's go handle that one. Um, yeah, this, part, this is a good one. This is a uh, CSS oh, question. Okay. Um, Great. And one says, okay, uh, this person is working with text boxes. I'm going to guess within a UX component, but they can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and they know how to deal with the padding between the text and the box frame. But what they want to know is, can they hide the frame altogether? They want the frame to disappear. And I was wondering if you okay, this is for a text box. A yeah, text box. Okay, great. Let so me go ahead and box, open it. They're doing data entry and editing. That's cool. Right. He likes. He wants to see the frame because it lets the user have a queue that that's a field they can edit. But if you know, for just regular static text, that box is. It makes it look like it's something they can edit when they really can. Got it. Where's my data components here? Huh. <laughs> Here's my demonstration system. I must have done something. <laughs> so um, cool. Let's test what did I do? Is that the right uh, is that the Yeah, right no problem. Yeah. Oh, you are so smart. So, I've been experimenting with that lately. Hey, Actually, that? let me... Yeah, let me talk about that. Yeah, where it magically repairs people. Yep. Um, I'll, I, actually, I'm going to spend a two minutes after I, I try to answer this question here okay. uh, and, and explain a little bit what that means. Because I actually have a project that it's reaching a point where that's going to become valuable, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. So, uh, but first, let me talk about, let me go ahead and create a new UX here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a UX component. For people who are new to Alpha, basically uh, this is the web projects control panel. You can see the different items that are in your project. Uh, in this case, I've got a set of UXs here. So I'm going to create a new one. I'm going to select web component. As you can see, we have a wide range of web components. I'm going to click UX. And I'm just going to go ahead and click OK and create a blank one. So I have a, basically a blank one here. And the, I'm going to go ahead and add a text box here, and I'm going to call it test text box. So now I've added a text box in here. And if I were to do a working preview, you're going to see that it has a title up top, a bounding box, and then the actual content inside. And if you'll notice, the reason it is displayed that way is because I've selected a specific style. So let me go ahead and show you that again. This is what it looks like right now. I can go into my properties for this UX, and you'll notice I have a style name here called GR Blue, which has just been the standard there. I can double click on that, and I can basically point to the CSS that I would like to use for this. So let's say I want to use more of an iOS 7 uh, look and feel. I can click OK. Now you'll notice I haven't changed anything on the control itself. I've merely said, hey, please use this style. And when I display it here, you're going to notice that it's got a different text, a little font, it's got the bounding box, which is larger, and it has the text that's inside there. Now, the reason that occurred is that if I go back to my text box and I go over to my control panel, so on the left are my different controls I can add, in the middle are the controls that are actually on my quote-unquote form, and uh, you can see there, and they're laid out, and then on the right you're going to see here is a set of values, and you'll notice one very important one here, called class, and you'll notice that it has a left caret, default, right caret, and the intent behind this is that it's saying, when you render this text box, use the class default, meaning the when I selected iOS 7, there's already a pre-made class for a text box, and it's going to use that CSS to render the look and feel of that. And in fact, if I click next to it, you're going to see that it opens up and shows me all of the made classes that are in my CSS file. And you can see there for, you'll kind of notice there's like for a page, for the grid header, for the button here, for, uh, for instance, lists, items there. We have scrollers, nodes, trees, etc. So there's a whole set of CSS that is available. And in fact, if I want to, uh, I can go ahead and let's see which, uh, let's go try and find text box. Let me go down here. Let's see if I have it up here. Bear with me here. List, list item tree, switch, win, menu pointer, tab button, icon. 
Uh, not sure where that is there. But what you can do is you can use this. You can come in here and create your own CSS to render this. So if I don't want to use the default there, I can actually come in here and start building my own CSS to be using here. So I can use off-the-shelf CSS or I can use that there. So that's method number one is you could go ahead and go in here, edit the local CSS and tell you how to do that. So for instance, let me kind of show you how to do that in another way. Is that I'm going to go ahead and show you this again. We have our text box, etc. I'm going to go back over here and you'll notice I have a class but I also have a style button. So I'm going to get rid of that class here and delete that default there. Okay, so I got rid of it. So when it renders this text box, it's not going to use that class library and that class. So now if I do working preview, you'll notice that, oh, it looks a little differently because basically it uses a kind of a standard HTML class to d display this information here. But I can go in here into this style here and change all of my things I want about that text box. So for instance, if I want the background to be like a blue, and let's say I want the, uh, uh, let's see, the color, let's say the background color, I want it to be like a green. Um, let's say I want the border here, the border I want it to be zero pixels. And then, so now let's go ahead and play with that and see what it's done there. You'll notice now, looks a little differently. And it doesn't look like anything because it doesn't look like I did it correctly. But uh, you can play with this style factor here. So let me get rid of that. Let's try it again, play it a little bit more. Okay, let's go back here. Actually, let's get rid of the coloring and let's just do this. Let's say the text, uh, I would like the family to be, uh, let's say, Calibra. And I want the size to be, let's say, 13 and the style I want it to be uh, italic and so I go in there notice how it's now rendering my text using that style data so this information right here allows you to change anything about that text box you want so you can remove the outside uh, borders etc you can play with that there you could do it either through a style or with a class uh, you could uh, define a class and then associate that class, which is essentially the same thing as a style. Basically what you're doing is putting this style information into a pointer and then attaching it to there. So my suggestion is go ahead and play with that, uh, either with the class editor or with the style, and then what that will allow you to do that. Now there's two things I want to also talk about is that there's the style for the data, but you'll notice also down here the control container class name. And if you go down here and read it, it talks about uh, that all controls are automatically wrapped in a div and you could go in and change it. So you can change not only the style of the control itself, but also essentially its wrapper, which gives you even more control on how you render it. And I realize that, you know, that doesn't answer answer quickly. Hopefully it's pointed there. But what I find often is that, uh, you know, it's kind of a trial and error. The other thing you may want to look out in there is go on to Google and do this and just say, okay, I'm searching for um, a uh, HTML text box no border, okay? And you'll notice that I can search on that and this will go in and tell you how you can do that and you can kind of look through, uh, let's see, what did they say here? Notice it says style, border, zero, solid, etc. So I can look at that and say, okay, let's go to uh, my style and I can say the border width is zero and then the style is uh, like hidden and you can play with that and come up with it. So you can use a combination of Google searches to kind of look for CSS. Like by the way, that's when you're doing it with like a style, but also I could say in here I can go text box, border, uh, HTML, text box, text box, no border, CSS and actually you can go in here and if you search there you'll see that you can actually get what the CSS would be to do something similar from there. Uh, in fact, here's the example is that you can set the outline to be none. So apparently in CSS it's called not border but outline. 
So you can play with that, and then what you can do is just either use the class or the style here. It's a trial and error, and then once you get there, you'll be good to go. In fact, I had a project that's going on right now where they had a desktop application, and they had a number of people trained on it, and they wanted to render that same desktop interface on a web thing. So in order to do that, we just went in and created a set of classes that mimic the look and feel for what the controls look like on the desktop, and we were able to get something that looked pretty darn close to what you would see on a desktop app running in a web browser. And again, you have infinite flexibility because every aspect about the rendering of that text box is controllable by you, either through the class association or through the style. So I hope that's enough pointers to kind of make, make it dangerous for you. Excellent, thank you. Um, question uh, was just a moment ago when you went to take a look for your uh, uh, web applications you saw that the list was empty and I think that was because you had selected a different project could you point out yeah. what that project thing is all about yeah let me um, let me kind of give a little background on how to do that is that um, when you start developing um, larger applications with alpha uh, when you create a new uh, what's called a workspace so workspace is essentially a holder for everything else. Within a workspace, you can have multiple projects. And the way you can do that is initially your initial workspace will create a default project and it will be empty. And then you'll start adding code into that. And so if we look at this um, and uh, we can go file, new project, we could actually create another project in here. Now, what happens is on the hard drive, if we go to the hard drive itself and look at the file structure, you're going to notice in here, uh, let's see here, let me go to my demonstration here. You're going to notice that I've got a folder here that says demonstration.webprojects. So this is my workspace file. It's at the top level. It creates a subfolder called demonstration or whatever your um, uh, project name is dot web projects. Now in here, you'll notice that when you first create one, there will be automatically created a default dot web project. And if I go in there, that's all of my different grids and UXs and everything that's in this one. But I could have a second test project in here, which has a smaller set of items, and then I, I can access them right through here. I can be working on the default one, or I can go to my test project, and you'll notice in my test project, all I have is one A5W page. Now, where this can become valuable, and we found it with this recent, is that I had a company that had created a application. Basically, they had gone through and set up a desktop web application. And their goal was then to also have a mobile application. Now, you could go ahead and start building the mobile components within your default web project. There's no problem with that. It would work fine. But they kind of said, ah, you know, it kind of gets messy. I mean, after a while, you'll have a mix of mobile components and desktop ones, whereas where the desktop's kind of the back office, the mobile. So the way we could do that is we could set it up to say, let's create a second project called mobile project, and in here, just have all your mobile components. Now, you could have set up two separate, complete workspaces, meaning I could have gone up here and said, I want to create a new workspace and created a whole separate structure for that mobile project. And that may be what you want to do. But there's one real cool benefit about setting it up this way here, is that when I go to Tools Alpha DAO Connection Strings, these connection strings and other kind of high-level pieces are available for both of my projects, both my back office and my mobile project. So in certain ways, it's actually easier to manage this because you're usually going to use the same connection strings for both projects. Maybe you're going back against the same database structure in the back office there. So there's some definite benefits to do that. And uh, the real benefit is that if you're going to have sort of the same implementation but maybe different sub-projects, like maybe an application that does time reporting. And then you're going to have another application that is also going to be on the same server and it's going to connect to the same database that does sort of uh, forecasting or budgeting. Then you can use this method to kind of keep them all within one master project or workspace and be able to access them accordingly from that standpoint there. 
Uh, and again, all it's doing is below the, the covers, it's setting up two subdirectories, and in those subdirectories, it's storing your files there. But the benefit of both of these subdirectories use all of your information at the top level and share it so you don't have to recreate all your connection strings and other pieces there. So it becomes kind of handy. So either method is acceptable. You can either create a new, work, new workspace and manage it that way, or you can create sub-projects and handle them as different projects, and both methods are equally, uh, they just have little pros and cons in terms of, of what you're doing there. Excellent. Um, here, you, oh, I have a couple good questions here. Um, awesome. One, I don't know if you know, but uh, if you know this one, but if not, we'll we'll find out. Um, this person is working with a, I'm going to guess a UX, but some sort of web component, and they want to know how do they trap SQL errors. So instead of having it blow up the uh, oh, good the point. Page. Okay, great. And actually, I'll I'll use an example here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and create an example here, um, and um, so I'm going to create a web component here and a UX here, okay? And I'm going to click OK. So I've got a blank UX component, and I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to add just some text, static text, and I'm going to also put on here what's called a label, okay? And this is just to kind of set the stage. Okay, so now in static text, I'm going to say here is my demonstration. And as you can see so far, nothing happens right here. I've just got this label here. Okay, so I'm going to save this as error trap UX. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to go to my server side implementation here, and I'm going to type in here something that says um, e.control. What is it called? Label it is equal to um, hello webinar. So just a simple, let's just see if this works here. Notice it's putting in hello webinar there. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy, but let's say up here I wanted to look up info in the database here. So you're going to put your database information, so you can do, you know, you can put in, uh, and this could be on an XBasic callback or anything like that, the, your series of code to do that. Now, you can absolutely do that. Now, let's do something here. It's, uh, let's say, uh, X is equal to one dot, uh, one dot dot one. So I'm purposely putting in a error here. This makes no sense at all. So now when I run my working preview, watch what happens. Notice it through an error. It said, when I ran this, I found this command here, and I don't know what you're trying to do. I'm confused here. Now, when you're running this in a web browser, this is what you would see. So instead of seeing your dialog with a nice message, this is what you would see on your dialog, or on your web page, as it compiles it. Give it a moment here. Not very pretty not nice at all. So the question becomes like, and, and so obviously this could have been in a SQL query and during the SQL query it caused a problem, it had a bad query or something like that. That's where error trapping comes in and this is a really good question. There's a whole subject around it but I'm going to show it to you very quick. Okay, and I'm going to use another feature that I talked about earlier. Watch this. I'm going to use my genie and this is a couple weeks ago I talked about my code library. And this is a great opportunity to use your code library. I'm going to go ahead and go to my code library, and I'm going to select error handling, and I'm going to say on dialog initialize. So if you haven't seen that, go back and check it out. Okay. So what I did is this, uh, it, it basically, I put some code in my thing here saying on error go to, and then give it a, uh, what's called error handler on dialog initialize, basically a pointer, it's like a go-to. And then you'll notice down here I have then on error, error dialog initialize. And so here's my code I had before, but what I did is I wrapped it using this on error and here. So now watch what happens when I do a working preview. And I'll walk you through this. 
So I click that. You'll notice now that it just said, oh, it trapped that error. It tell, told me what the error message was, uh, but it still represented my screen here. So for instance, if I go ahead and show you that in my browser, instead of getting that ugly error message now, it dies a little bit more gracefully. It's still not where I want it to be, but you'll notice that it shows me the UX and then gives me an indicator of what the error is. So the way that happened is I'm going to go ahead and put in here debug one, okay? So what debug one is, it allows me to walk through and step through my code. So I'm going to go ahead and do a working preview and I'm going to step through this code here. So I'm in my debugger and this is kind of a little bit more advanced. So for folks that don't have experience on this, don't freak out. It's just uh, allows you to walk through your code and see what happens. So watch what happens. I put a debug in here. So it's starting to run my function. The first thing it's going to do is register that on error go to. So I'm going to click step. Now it's going to try and execute this statement right here. Watch what happens. Okay. You notice it didn't go to this statement. It jumped down here to this statement right here. So when it detected an error, instead of just throwing up its hand and spitting out the information, it says, no, 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 I'm going to let you handle it, Dean. You want to handle this error, it's all yours. And so now I can put in code right here to do what I want to do. And in this case, what I do is first I get the error code. Then what I do is from that error code, I get the error text. And so you'll notice that basically the system will say, oh, I tried to run your code, but this was the error that I got, and therefore I have that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is in a on dialog initialize, if I say e.javascript and give it a little JavaScript, in this case creating an alert, then what it would do is it will just run this. So instead of dying, it then runs it, and sure enough what we see in here is all it does is throw up this, this JavaScript here. Now that's a very simplistic way of handling this. What I could do in here is I could, for instance, write to an error log. I could send an email or text to someone. I could redirect to another page to die gracefully. It is really up to you what you want to do. So in your particular situation, if you get a bad SQL call, Instead of just having it throw up a bad message, wrap it in this on here go to, and then in here grab it and then die gracefully either by uh, sending them to a error page or uh, maybe retrying the call or doing something, etc. But this is your way to die gracefully so you don't get these very cryptic, very ugly messages that are given to the user without doing it. And again, what I want to show everybody is that you're going to use this so much that after you get a prototype there, create a code library error handler webinar, and you'll notice that it just automatically pasted in my ready to go error code, and I can just start typing in my code there, I'm off to the races. And you can actually create different versions of it. For instance, in this e.javascript, what will happen there is that in my on-dialog initialize, that's how I send a message back. When I'm in an xbasic function, I would, um, I would be saying xbasic function name equals there because what happens is it's going to take this JavaScript and send it back there and I guess I jumped off the curve there. But definitely use your, um, your, uh, your code library to your advantage to pre-code these things and then every time you have an on dialog initialize, the first thing I do is I put in my error trapping code and then I go in and start writing my code in there. That way I have the discipline to know that I will always die gracefully. And, and what this becomes very important too is that let's say I'm running this locally on my machine. Well, I can put in this debug one and walk through it. That's okay and it's easy for me to do it. But once it's running up on the server, it's going to ignore that debug. And I may not really understand, you know, the server environment's a little different. So maybe it's connected to a different database than the one I'm using for development. What this will allow you to do is put in whatever kind of error messaging you want to kind of give you those hints, including you could also, uh, you know, write to an error log so you can write it right to a text file on the server and look up from there. So great question, very powerful error handling capability built into it. The important thing is you want to die gracefully uh, so that the user gets a okay experience, 
versus throwing up something very cryptic, which can be very concerning to a person using the app. They might think that something more serious is wrong. Uh, and in this case, you might be able to trap the problem and notify yourself and allow the user to say, oh, yeah, we're working on it. Let me, you know, we've detected the area. We'll let you know what's going on and go from there. Excellent. All right, just a quick question back to the, um, the workspace question uh, that we were talking about uh, back with the Web Projects Control Panel. And the question is, when you publish workspaces, do they publish separately or does it publish everything in the same workspace? Very good question. The answer is they publish separately. So, for instance, I'm on default right here and I click my publishing profiles. I have my publishing profiles right here, my local web route and my test. In here I can set what folder I want to publish this to, etc. Mm -hmm. When I go to my test project and do the profiles there, you'll notice that I have different profiles. And so I can set like a different directory, I could even set it for a different server whatever I want to. So the project profiles are associated with a project, not the overall workspace. So you could set it up saying, okay, for this, publish it up on the server on this folder with these settings. For this project right here, publish it up to a different folder, even a different server, and do those things there. So great question, and they are handled at the project level, so you have control over being able to publish them both in a different manner, which is often what you'll find out with most projects. Awesome. Um, here's a great question, one I've run into myself, uh, that I think other people will too. Uh, but this person writes in saying that they're trying to place some items into a panel header, you know, on a UX, and they're having some problems. Um, they have items to the left, I said that's fine, and they have an image centered exactly where they want it. When they try to add something on the right, it appears on top of the image, and it pushes the image to the left can't seem to figure out how to position something just right within panel headers. Uh, would you have any advice on, on how to go about doing that? And another question is, are you on mute? Because I can't hear you. Put it on mute. I'm sorry. Um, gotcha. So uh, for people who are new, just bear with me as I walk through this. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a panel card to this UX control here. And panel cards are empty, or they're invisible. So if you'll notice, I went to working preview and you didn't see anything at all. But now I can put my controls in here. So let's say I put in a text box here, okay? So I put it inside that panel, and again, you're not gonna see anything around, but it's gonna have the text box in there. Looks good. But what you can do is on the panel card, you can right click on panel card and say add uh, panel header, okay? And so what it's done is it's created a special container that is right underneath panel card, and this container is called a panel header, so it's going to sit at the top of the panel. So now let's go in here and show you the working preview, and you'll notice that there's just, you know, there's this gray area up here, so you're not seeing it, but there is that area there. So now I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to go inside the panel header, and I'm going to add some static text. So I'm just going to put in there and I'm going to say, my cool app. Okay. So now what I've done is in the panel header, I've set this little my cool app text. And now when I do the working preview, you'll notice that my header is exposed. It's at the very top. And you'll notice my cool app here is displayed in that header. And in fact, if I go into my web browser and show it in the web browser, what's kind of nice about panel headers is that A, they're stuck to the top, and they are responsive in nature. So you'll notice it's automatically resizing that panel header to the width of the item from there. Okay, so the question is what I want to do now is I want to add a image, and so I'm going to put an image in there, and so I'm just going to put a CSS icon in there, just for giggles. Okay, this is my, one of my favorite CSS icons. So you'll notice that I'm going to go and get rid of my there. So now let me show you mine here. So you'll notice that I have my text, and right after it, it's displaying my little martini glass there. Now what I can do is in here I want to put a space between these two. Now I could go in and put like a table and do some other things like that, uh, containers, etc. But there's a nice little feature here called a tab stop. 
So I'm going to put a tab stop after my cool app. And a tab stop is another hidden item there. So you'll notice in this, notice what it did with the tab stop, is that it, it tabbed over to the end, in this case, to the very end. So now my little um, glass, there's that hidden control between the two of them. And in fact, if I open it up in here to my full preview once again, it is responsive in nature, which is super handy. And you'll notice, as I move that, notice what's happening. It's automatically adjusting that tab stop. So now let's go back in here, and I'm going to add another tab stop. And I'm going to add another image here. Actually, I want my glass image to be here. And I'm going to put my other image. Let's see, what's a good one here? CSS icon. Um, let's just do something cool like that. That looks kind of neat. Okay. So now I say this. Let's go, let's go uh, panel, header, tab, stop. Okay, so let me go in my working preview now. And notice, it's automatically kind of stretched everything out. So I have my text on the left. I have my there, and in between is there's one hidden tab stop here and one hidden tab stop there. And do a fast preview. You'll notice in here, it's, uh, it's loading that preview up for me real quick. Is that the old one? It must be the old one. Here you go. Let me do a full, oh, I'm sorry. Gosh darn it. Sorry, hit it too fast. Let me do a full preview because it has to spit out there. Okay. What's going on here? Why is it not showing that? Hmm. Well, not sure why. I'll have to look at some. Maybe there's something up that I did wrong, but. Um, but the important thing, and back to the question, is that you can use these tab stops to kind of auto-align the pieces that go there. And again, it is uh, within the environment, it is using responsive so that, for instance, as you squeeze this, this will move over, this will move over as much as possible until they get on top of each other to show that. So use the tab stop as your mechanism to kind of lay things out. Oh, I know why it is. Look, look, I had a hidden little return there. So my apologies. That's why I was looking strange. Let's try, let's see if that fixes it there. Because when you put a return, it can kind of screw things up from that standpoint. Okay. No, it doesn't like that. I wonder what's going on there. Again, live demo, that's the problem. That's how it works, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what you'll see is that middle image, as I move these things back and forth, the middle image will try and stay in the middle, and the tab stops will grow and shrink accordingly. So try those out. But that should hopefully help you out in terms of what's going on in that. Maybe, maybe this photo isn't part of my library. Should be. Ah. Could be oh, well. Excellent. All right, well, thank you. Um, a couple of people have asked about just the dates for things. They're hearing about a new version of Alpha Anywhere coming out, about a new sample application. I think there have been some screenshots circulating around about the inspection app. Uh, both of those are due for March. I suspect the sample app will be out before Alpha Anywhere. They are shooting for the very end of March for the new release of Alpha Anywhere, but as you know those dates can slip a little bit, uh, but that's that seems to be on target at this moment. So that's, that's the latest. That's the inside scoop on that. Uh, and we have our orientation series coming up too. We that's do just that. going to be announced. Yeah, very cool. Um, the uh, uh, someone has, has asked a question about MongoDB, and they said that it seems that Alpha Anywhere is mapping onto sort of a relational structure. But is there any thought for, that Alpha Anywhere is going to be supporting the flexible sort of non-SQL or no SQL uh, structure? Uh, there are no stated plans, but man, if I were a betting guy, I'd say yeah, because what. Just uh, since we only have a minute or two left, but one, if you look at um, a lot of the techniques they're now teaching and starting to implement, 
is that SQL databases obviously are very mature, very solid, very powerful, but sometimes can be a little bit of an inhibitor because of their structural nature. Um, and it's hard to create like fluid apps that kind of, you know, sometimes these data structures can get very complicated. And with a NoSQL approach, instead of modeling your data as a relational structure, you can model it as a object structure. And object structures are very flexible and very there. And the cool thing about object structures is that they can be what are called serialized into JSON. So you can take a, um, a object in that you're using, especially in JavaScript, and turn it into basically a text piece of text and turn it back and forth in between the two. And that's very easy to not do, it's built into it. So instead of creating this very complicated relational structure, you can actually design a JSON object to say, uh, trap a company and its employees, and then store that all as one chunk of data. Now there's certain situations where that's good and bad. I mean, you have to look at your particular application. But in the area of rapid prototyping, it's much faster just to write a class structure for an object in, in JavaScript and have that ready to go and just say, hey, save this into a NoSQL database, than to sit down, create a relational structure, lay out all the tables, lay out all the foreign keys, create all the code around that. So the answer is, at this point in time, we're really trying to say, hey, you can use NoSQL and, and we'll kind of treat it like a relational database. But the future is really about natively consuming objects coming out of a NoSQL database, uh, which will allow you to do more rapid prototyping, a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you save complex data. And our whole goal is to actually allow you to deploy things faster. So I can't give you a definitive answer, but again, being a betting person, as we incorporate Node.js into our core technology, stack, that is going to be coming more and more handy. Uh, and, and what's nice is that you're going to find there's a lot of great resources out there that are already using NoSQL databases that you'll be able to tap into to help you build and deploy your solutions. So I hope that gives you a little flavor. Again, no exact plans now. I want to be very clear on that since they will kill me if I say something like that. <laughs> they will. Uh, but they will. They will. They're like, oh, <laughs> like we don't have enough on her. You know, I think they should do that. No. <laughs> but that is the direction we're going. And um, as we get closer, especially with Mongo, we'll show some demonstrations of how you can use Mongo to store sort of uh, some very complex information very readily and use them within your application. That's terrific. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week at and at other future webinars. A copy of today's webinar will be posted in about two days to videos.alphasoftware.com. Thanks again, and goodbye. Take care.